All right, hello once again, Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College. I've been going over a series of video presentations for the Rankin Technical College AWD Application and Web Development 1111.NET Framework with Web Databases class. The main textbook for the class is scheduled to be ASP.NET MVC with Entity Framework and CSS. I have decided first to go over several copies, or several chapters, I should say, of the textbook, excuse me, Professional ASP.NET MVC 5, by John Galloway of Microsoft and others. So far, I've gone over the first nine chapters, getting started, controllers, views, models, forms and HTML helpers, data annotations and validations, membership authorization and security, AJAX, and routing. I'm skipping chapter 10, NuGet, skipping chapter 11 ASP.NET Web API. I'm skipping chapter 12 single page application with Angular JS and I'm skipping chapter 13 dependency injection. They're all important chapters but let's face it I, I don't have time to go through every chapter in this book and every chapter in another book. So I'm up to chapter 14 here. We just jumped into it and we're getting into defining test-driven development that you see right here. So this is the author's definition. Test-driven development is the process of using unit tests to drive the design of your production code by writing the tests first and then writing just enough production code to make these tests pass. On the surface, the end result of traditional unit testing and test-driven development is the same production code along with the unit test that describe the expected behavior. If both are done correctly, being able to tell by looking at the unit test whether the test came first or the production code came first can often be impossible. And let's face it, if it works, it's the old chicken which came first, the chicken or the egg. Do you really care? All right, when we talk about unit testing being a quality activity, we're primarily speaking on or of the quality activities of reducing bugs in software. Practicing TDD achieves this goal, but it is a secondary goal, as the primary purpose is to increase the quality of the design. By writing the unit test first, you describe the way you want components to behave before you've written any of the production code. All right, and I think that to some people at least, when they start to look at test-driven design, it, it can be a little bit intimidating. I don't know if that's the right word, but different for them. I mean, think about it, all right? Let's, let's suppose that you're, you know, you, you've just gotten married. So you and your spouse have just gotten married, and you have your first child. While, while, the, while one of you is pregnant, all right, you're probably not going to sit there and come up with every scenario that that child is going to go through in his or her life and create a unit test for it. Now, you might do that. Maybe some people do. With most of us, you know, you have the child and then you, you're thrown into the situation and then you decide how you're going to handle it. But think about it, uh, the fact that it actually might make sense to do it in a test-driven design way you know there are certain things that are going to happen in a child's life. All right, it's been very interesting for me because in May of 2017, I became a grandfather. And it's so different watching the way that my daughter raise and my future son-in-law raise their daughter as opposed to the way I raised, my wife and I raised our daughters. And I'm not saying she's doing anything wrong. She's a terrific mom. He's a terrific dad. But it's just certain things, and, and part of it is a generational thing, as things have changed. I mean, when my kids, who are now 27, 27, the, 20, the older 27-year-old is going to be 28 in about a month. But let's, So let's say 28, 27, and 21, they didn't have things like cell phones when they were kids. I watch my granddaughter now, she gets frustrated when she can't, and being 
between 12 and 13 months, she has a problem when she can't pinch and zoom on her phone. Not her phone, but on a phone. She knows where the home button is, etc. I mean, just not that that's something that you have to do test-driven development for, but like I said, things change over time. All right, the red-green cycle. You still follow the same guidelines for unit tests set out earlier. Write small focus tests against components in isolation and run them in an automated fashion. Because you write the test first, you often get into a rhythm when practicing TDD. You write the test, you run it, and you watch it fail because the production code was not yet written. You write just enough production code to make the test pass, and you rerun it, and you watch it pass. They, they term this cycle the red-green cycle because most unit testing frameworks represent failed tests with red text, and UI elements and pass tests with green tests, green text. Being diligent here is important. Don't write any new production code unless you have a failing unit test that tells you what you're doing wrong. After the test passes, stop writing new production code. When practiced regularly, this practice teaches you when to stop writing new code. Again, as mentioned, just do enough to make the test pass. You also get into the same rhythm when you're fixing bugs. You might need to debug around the code to discover the exact nature of the bug, but after you've discovered it, you write a unit test that describes the behavior, behavior you want, you watch it fail, you modify the production code to correct the mistake. Notice, you'll have the benefit of the existing unit tests to help you ensure that you don't break any exist, existing expected behavior with your change. Refactoring. This is an important concept. You'll often find yourself with messy code as a result of a very small incremental code change. You've been told to stop when the light goes green, so how do you clean up the mess you've made by piling small change on top of small change? The answer is refactoring. The word refactoring can be overloaded, so in other words, it can have several meanings. So we should be very clear that when we talk about refactoring here, we're talking about the process of changing the implementation details of production code without changing its externally observable behavior. It says here, refactoring is a process you undertake only when all unit tests are passing. As you refactor and update your production code, the unit tests should continue to pass. All right. You may have even seen this. Now, I, I'm sure that when I give you this example, it probably won't work, but let's try it anyway. So let's assume that I came into my models folder here, and I, uh, let's, I'm going to see if I can find a good example. Um, all right. So let's go into my models folder, and I will create a new, in fact, let's just create a new controller. All right. Right now, we've got an account, a home, and a manage. I'm going to right mouse click on here. I'm going to choose add controller and we'll make it empty. And I'm just going to call it demo controller. I'm not going to have it do anything. So you'll notice that after it comes in here, it'll create a new controller here that's called demo controller. There it is. And it gave me a demo folder down here. Since I made it an empty controller, there's nothing in there. Now, if I come in here and I right mouse click and I choose rename, okay, and I say in here, let's say that I meant to call it demo two controller as an example, all right? So again, I come in here and I wanna change this. So I'm, again, I'm gonna right mouse click, choose rename and I make this demo to controller and I hit enter. It says you are renaming a file. Would you like to perform a rename in this project of all references to the code element demo controller? All right. And yes, I do. But the point is, it's act asking me here if I want to refactor. So notice when I say yes, notice what this says right here. I click yes. Notice how it changed that. 
All right. It didn't change the name of my folder named demo, but it did come in and it changed this. That's refactoring in action. Now, that's not a great example, but it's the one that came to mind when I started going over this. All right. Resist the temptation to change tests and production code all at the same time. Refactoring should be mechanical and almost mathematical process of structured code changes that do not break unit tests. All right. Structuring changes with a range, act, and assert. They mentioned that many of these examples follow what's called 3A, arrange, act, and assert, that was actually created, what looks like, close to 14 and a half years ago, to describe a structure for unit testing that reads a bit like three paragraphs. You arrange, you get the environment ready, you act by calling the method you're testing, and you assert, you ensure that things that you expect to have happen, happen. Now, I'm just, I'm not going to go over the tests that they go through in here, but they do give examples quite often, all right, when they're talking about something. Okay. All right. The single assertion rule, middle of page 412. When you look at the 3A stack example, you'll see only a single assert to ensure that you got back the expected result. Notice, resist the temptation to test more than one behavior with a unit test. A good unit test is about testing a very small bit of functionality, normally a single behavior. Keeping your test small like this and single focus means when you break something, you're more likely to break only a single test. Some people call this single assertion rule. It says don't confuse this with thinking that your test should only have a single call to assert. Calling assert several times to verify one logical piece of behavior is often necessary. But the key takeaway is this. Remember to test just one behavior at a time. Now, building a unit test project, I've already shown you this. So as it says here, by selecting the unit test checkbox, you're telling ASP.NET, the, the ASP.NET project wizard, not only to create the project, but also to populate it with a default set of unit tests. So they talk about them there. Let's just quickly look. There's home controller test. Look familiar? AAA. Arrange, act, and assert. Now they mention on page 413 in here, the default action templates give you just enough functionality to get you started. When you create the new project, it automatically opens the homecontroller.cs And it gives you these default unit tests of arrange, act, and assert. All right. They mention here, looking at this line, it says, did you notice the use of the as keyword to cast the result of the view result type? You see, it's an interesting code smell. In other words, it's something that you look at and wonder whether it's really the right thing. Is a cast necessary? Well, the bottom line is this. It's recommended. All right. As mentioned before, if I go out here and I jump out to the Internet here and I go to Amazon.com and I go down to Books and I type in here Design unit testing effective unit testing now, this is Java but you get the idea software development design and coding 
unit testing, pragmatic unit testing, mastering unit testing. All right. I have no idea if they have any ASP.NET unit testing books. Testing ASP.NET, well, that's web apps. All right. So rather than design unit testing, how about test driven development? TDD. And this is normally what you're going to have. You're going to have books that go over this stuff. Here's another book by uh, another APRES book. And if I go out to this, let's just very quickly look and see in the table of contents. There's unit testing <clears throat> with MVC applications. That's the kind of thing that you're typically going to get. But there are books. Again, <clears throat> I can come out here and type in ASP.NET test driven development in the status bar here. 10,500,000 results. <clears throat> and there's a lot of stuff in here. Eventually, if I look long enough, yeah, here's some videos, but eventually I'll find something under the msdn.microsoft, guidelines for test-driven development. All right. Now, you might say, well, that's dated. Yeah, but the, the principles typically don't change that much over time. That would not probably be a very good place to start. <clears throat> All right. couple things here. Number one, test only the code you write. I mentioned this before. One of the more common mistakes that people new to unit testing and test-driven development make is to test code they didn't write, whether that's purposely or not purposely. Your tests should be focused on the code you wrote, not the logic or the code it depends on. Now that said, as you're testing code that interacts with other people's code, it's natural to think, wow, why didn't they do this? Wow, why didn't they do that? You know what? If it's not your code, if it's not your responsibility, you don't do anything more with it. Tests that test more than one thing are called integration tests, not unit tests. You can safely assume, it says here, whether the action result is written by you or by the ASP.NET team, that the action result code is su sufficiently tested on its own. All right. So some advice that's given here. Let's check our time. I'm at 1825. I think this is a good place to stop. Here on the bottom of page 415, under advice for unit testing, your ASP.NET MVC and ASP.NET Web API applications. So I'll be back with that next part of this lecture shortly.